which was big. And so we went from x to x times b mod, uh, mod p with probability 1 over the size of b for every b and b. Today uh, I'm going to talk about another random walk. This was last time. Today, we're going to talk about the following on the walk. So now, I'm going to have not finitely many vertices, but continue many vertices. So, my space is going to be uh, Rb modulo d, just the t dimension, the d dimensional toes. And this random walk would be given by some measure on uh, on um, the group of uh, integer of d by d invertible integer matrices. Let's call by probability measure. So let me emphasize it. Let's give it a name, new on SLDZ, by which I mean that uh, from any x, x I go to uh, gx uh, with probability new of g. Now this is a countable uh, set, right? So probability measure is uh, given by the weights I give of every atom. Um, it's not particularly bad to think of this probability measure as uh, uh, being finitely supported. That is an interesting case. Or even let's be very concrete. Here's an example which I think is uh, sufficiently interesting for us. Take any two matrices, A, B, e, two by two integer matrices, which do not commute. Any two matrices of this uh, would do. Uh, for instance, just to be very explicit, maybe I take A to be this matrix, and B maybe this matrix, and hopefully they don't commute. And each term you flip a coin head apply A tail apply B. So this is a reasonable uh, random walk. Uh, we, so you could think, in this case, you could think of uh, the two torus. I'm basically giving you a directed graph structure on the two torus. I have continued m many vertices, but unlike um, the graphs considered in the previous talk, I have only two edges uh, going out from every vertex and only two edges going into every vertex. Um, more generally, this works so for more generally, in the general case, I want to assume something about uh, I want to assume something about the support of new. I want to assume the support of new is uh, large in some sense. So I want to assume that if I take all the elements, all the matrices, which have positive probability according to nu. I take the group, they generate gamma. I want to assume that gamma acts totally irreducibly on Rd. So what irreducible means, we learned from Gadi. 
but uh, I want not just gamma, but any finite index subgroup of gamma to act irreducibly on Rd. And <coughs> I want to assume something which, okay, some condition which at some point I would explain what it is, or maybe I would explain what it is, but it, at the moment you don't have to pay uh, too much attention to exactly what this means, but I want gamma to have a proximal element. And what is a proximal element? A proximal, so this is a matrix. A matrix has eigenvalues. I want, so one of these eigenvalues would be, uh, I want it to be a unique eigenvalue which is bigger in absolute values than all other eigenvalues. And I want this eigenvalue, which dominates all the rest, I want it to be simple, to have multiplicity one. This is what I mean by a proximal element. And it turns out that any two integer, two by two integer matrices which do not commute, satisfy this condition. So, what can I tell you about this random walk? Um, I can tell you something about it. I'd like to present today a theorem about this random walk um, by Bourguin, Fuhrman, Moses, and myself, which in some sense, Fuhrman, Moses and myself, which in some sense is uh, maybe more sophisticated, but it's sort of it's an analog uh, in some sense of this estimate of uh, Bourguin, Glibichuk, and Konyagin I showed you uh, last time. So let mu be a measure. on S, L, D, Z as above. And maybe I want new to be finitely supported, or what I really want is there to be some uh, some moment for J. I don't want somehow to have huge elements uh, with high probability for some eps, for some epsilon. Um, suppose, and this relates to what we discussed in the problem session, what it means to have large Fourier coefficient. Suppose that for some x naught in the torus, and uh, some integer vector b, I take um, um, the n-fold multiplicative convolution of my measure applied to a delta measure at the point x naught. I take Fourier transform of this at B. Suppose this is bigger than delta. I'll write some uh, clarifying. Uh, let me finish stating the theorem, then I sort of, in an orderly way, explain what I mean by this uh, multiplicative convolution, though it's, in, it's the same that, uh, notation that I used in my previous lecture. Uh, then what can I say? And then we need to try to understand how to read the theorem. Then we need to understand how to prove the theorem. Then there would be some integer vector p. And some natural number q. Such that uh, q is not too large. q is less than some constant the size of B over delta to some other constant. Uh, 
and x0 is close um, to p over q is less than another constant e to the minus cn so this is a bit hard to digest but in some sense it's an analog of the kind of estimates we had um, last time first of all let me introduce this notation so if uh, mu is a measure on SLDZ and maybe mu a measure on the toes then this multiplicative convolution is simply I take G I apply it to mu and give this weight uh, new G G over all S of Z ok so this is this notation and of course uh, I want to take a random walk so I'm going to apply this many times and this is by definition I'm going to write it as if there are n of these news so this is a notation now I have here um, a collection of uh, um, let me remind you that this uh, estimate on Fourier coefficient maybe I'll also define the Fourier coefficient of a measure the Fourier coefficient is now indexed if I have a measure on the toes it's indexed by the lattice ZD so if I have a B and ZD and I have a measure I can define the Fourier transform by taking E of depending on your preference X or minus X B uh, inner product X D mu of X this is a Fourier transform of a measure um, and uh, what this uh, theorem says so this uh, let me give some corollaries of this theorem just to try to explain what it says so for instance suppose I have for any irrational point x naught in the toes I can and some let's say continuous function f continuous f I can look at the sum g1 gn all of them are elements in uh, my group of uh, d by d integer matrices I take them each with the right probability and now I apply gn times g1 apply this all to so maybe I would write the f of gn g1 x ok so now I, ha I average f on some uh, collection of points um, and I subtract from it the integral of f I claim that this would let's call this the epsilon and this goes to 0 as n goes to infinity for any irrational point x0 now of course if I start with a point zero no matter which matrix I multiply it with zero times a matrix is going to remain zero so this random walk would remain at zero so if I start with a point zero and I have some function which is maybe 
zero around zero, but big somewhere else, I can't expect this kind of behavior. And more generally, if x naught was a rational point, again, I multiply a rational point of denominator something, let's say q. I have a rational point of denominator q. I multiply it by a integer matrix, I still get a point of denominator q. And I can't escape from zero. So if somehow my function um, is zero or has some behavior, I can't expect um, to know how a function behaves by sampling it only in a finite collection of points. So this condition of irrationality is absolutely essential. Otherwise, this condition is trivially false. Let's see why this condition, why this corollary follows from the theorem. So, by uh, Wells equidistribution criterion, which I discussed in the problem session yesterday, in order to check this, it's enough to check, it's enough to check this for, uh, for these complex exponentials, for these characters. for uh, these type of functions, right? For mm. They're not particularly mysterious. This is just uh, because I can approximate any continuous function uniformly by trigonometric polynomials. But when I apply it on, uh, if I apply both sides, so let's try to see what happens if I specialize that equates that sort of expression for uh, f uh, equals this type of function. Well, first of all, the average of a non-trivial complex exponential is zero, at least this b is not equal to zero. Um, when b is zero, f is a constant function, and this thing is zero trivially. And then I have epsilon n, would just be what is the sum of uh, the exponent evaluated in the g1, gn, x0? No, that's exactly a different way of writing this complicated expression. Epsilon n is exactly this uh, Fourier transform of this uh, complicated looking measure at B, maybe with an absolute value. Now suppose it doesn't go to zero. So suppose if this goes to zero for every B, then I get equidistribution. So suppose for some B, which is non-zero, and Ni, going to infinity, this epsilon n does not go to zero. Well, what do I know from this uh, theorem? Then there would be some pi integer vectors. There would be some qi natural numbers. Um, Q would be bounded by, well, let's see what happens here. This delta is essentially my epsilon n, which is not going to zero. My B is fixed, so Q is bounded by some fixed constant. Q bounded by some fixed constant, capital Q. It does not depend on I. Um, and
Um, what do I know? I know that x0 minus uh, pi over qi is less than some c2 e to the minus c ni, which goes to 0. So this has only finitely many possibilities. The theorem gave me a uniform bound on the QI, and of course PI, I am looking at everything modulo 1, PI has finitely many possibilities. So I can approximate my point arbitrarily close by one of these finitely many possibilities. At some point, this, uh, all of these PI over QI would uh, uh, have to be fixed and would basically have to be equal to X0. So for I large enough, the sequence pi over qi is fixed and equal to x0. So x0 is, uh, is rational. Now, uh, moreover, I'm not going to show this in detail, but it's certainly uh, believable. He, this theorem actually gives the rate. Now, it can't give possibly a uniform rate for all points, because there are points which are Dufant and which can be approximated absurdly well by rational numbers, real numbers. But uh, another corollary is if f is, let's say, smooth, don't really need smooth, but uh, let's take it to be smooth, and my point x0 is what's known as your Fantine generic, which basically means that x0 minus uh, p over q is less than, sorry, is at, le is at least uh, some constant, q to the minus some other constant for so all q. Okay, you can't approximate this point absolutely well, which you know simply that, for instance, any algebraic point satisfies this condition. Then, uh, in fact, this uh, error term, this epsilon n, which was the difference between sampling my function, uh, let me write it in short and maybe. Sampling along this random walk, and the true average of the function is going to be exponentially uh, is going to decay exponentially fast. The exponent depends on your Fantine uh, on the Stefantine exponent, but anyway, this decays exponentially fast. So this is an exponential rate of equidistribution. Uh, let me mention, so, let me mention that there's sort of beautiful, so this proof uses arithmetic combinatorics um, and sort of goes along a similar general plan as the proof of the Bourguin, Gribichuk, and Yagen estimates I've shown you. Um, there is beautiful work. There is uh, work by Benoit and Juan 
using some ergodic theory which uh, gives less but is more general so which gives less but is more general more general sort of gives less so what they can show under fairly general conditions if so this is some kind of condition maybe there's a Ritzky closure of this group generated by the support of my measure is semi-simple and a sort of a stupid condition which should hopefully be removed at some point that it has no complex factors um, then for any irrational So, in the language of um, weak star uh, convergence, the fact that for any that these epsilon ends go to zero can be phrased as saying that some sequence of measures tends to the uniform measure. So they have something weaker and non-quantitative. That if you, you average these measures. they converge weak star, which is sort of a sensible way of conversion to a big measure without a weight no weight this is quite nice work, but I'm not going to talk uh, about the ergodic theoretic approach one of the themes of this uh, summer school is the interplay between discrete and continuous um, random works, discrete and continuous models. So there's sort of quite something quite amusing which goes on here. You pursue similar analysis to what I did here. I'm not going to do it in detail. you could get some interesting information about a discrete random walk. So, um, consider the discrete random walk uh, on uh, pairs let's say P over Q Q is fixed there's no common denominator of all of the P's in Q Q fixed given by mu so under our conditions once maybe you need to assume that Q is relatively prime to something you get here a nice a random walk on a finite object you have a nice graph um, and unlike the previous case when we considered this product uh, product multiplicative group uh, so the multiply, multiplication on Z modulo P star um, the graph structure here is quite amusing so it follows from uh, this generality from the work of uh, Pibers, Zabo, um, Bouillard, Green, Tau they have some uh, expansion estimates of these two teams uh, which sort of are generalizations 
of expansion estimates by Helfgott, plus uh, somehow technology of Bourguin and Gambud, that um, these discrete random walks are in the proper sense expanders. So I'm mixing languages. I'm mixing the language of random walks and the language of graphs. Um, but you could think of maybe my set S or my measure to be uh, supported on some symmetric set, finite symmetric set, and then you get some kind of graph. And then you have here a family of uh, expanders. At least for uh, at least for p, at least for p prime. The whole talk yesterday about uh, Bourguin, uh, Glibichuk, Konyagin was for the case of p prime. Hmm. Q is prime. Thank you. Is a big Q. Um, in this result, it actually becomes quite um, highly non-trivial to understand the relation between the case of Q prime and general Q. So value shows that these. Uh, so, if you don't know what an expander means, or you don't want to think about graphs, what this says is that after. If I do my random walk for some big constant times log q steps, I would get a distribution which is uh, very, very close to uniformly distributed on my finite object. Okay, that's what this uh, vague statement here. So maybe I'll write it down. For c large enough, but not dependent on Q. Um, after C log Q steps of random walk, the distribution I get by uh, starting with some points, this time inside my finite object. So maybe you can think of X not as being a rational point. And I go this n step to the uniform measure the distance in the total variation norm. The total variation is uh, exponentially small. Very small. Well, you could take it exponentially small, you could take it smaller than a fixed number, doesn't really matter. Um, so, value shows that this shows this expansion or mixing property for Q square three. Um, and what does this theorem, our theorem here, give? So it it does not give. So what this theorem gives is that if you take a rational point of a large denominator and you apply this random walk uh, up to some scale which is polynomial in Q, you would see equidistribution. So this would give you this. Uh, Continuous, the continuous random walk. So the result about the embedding, embedding the discrete, the discrete random walk in the continuous uh, space. You get some kind of, uh, you get some weaker result than 
expand in this sense above. So there's some kind of uh, equity distribution going on, but in a much weaker sense than the total variation. But somehow, once you embed the discrete thing in the continuous thing and you study the continuous thing, you couldn't care less how the skew decomposes as a product of primes uniformly in the composition of Q to primes. Um, and in fact, this was used by uh, so this was used by uh, Bourguin and Peter Value to establish that if S uh, is a Ritz the group generated by some finite set of matrices is the Ritzky dense in S, L, and Z S, L, N, sorry, no Z here the Ritzky dense in S, L, N the Cayley graph uh, given by uh, S, L, N Z mod Q and S is a family of expanders uniformly in how is a family of expanders uniformly in uh, how Q decomposes So there's a nice interplay here between the continuous and the discrete. Um, the proof proceeds uh, in, uh, on lines which are quite similar to the proof I gave of Bourguin, Glibichuk, and Konyagin in the previous lecture. So the basic idea of the proof, let me uh, write it somewhere. Which board will I sacrifice now? So the basic strategy I assume that some uh, Fourier coefficient, when I go n steps in the random walk, I apply to some measure. It's not so important now what the measure is. Maybe delta at a point, that's always the case which we care about. But assume that this, uh, that some Fourier coefficient is big. Then we show that uh, if I convolve less times um, this measure has many this is a Fourier has many largish not as large but somehow polynomial in delta large a Fourier coefficient. The same kind of uh, bootstrap uh, procedure which uh, in the style of Bourguin. I want to state this vague um, 
general idea into precise language. Maybe I'll uh, introduce some notation. So, mu being any measure, possibly the delta measure at a point, which is sort of the case we really care about, I would let mu n be this measure you get from mu after applying n steps of the random walk. Okay, so this is useful notation. And um, what I want is the following. Suppose that I have that mu n hat in some b is bigger than delta. Then, uh, for appropriate m, and n, which is roughly uh, n such that uh, logarithm of n over the size of my vector b is somehow the same up to a constant is m um, and sum m another integer parameter with uh, log of m over the size of b being again roughly proportional to m but I want to be a bit more specific I want it to be uh, something like 1 minus alpha log n over the side of b. Okay, so I want, I have here n, which is a big integer, m, which is somewhat smaller integer, and if you think of the size of b as being constant, which is highly recommended, then basically n and m are uh, polynomially related, but n is bigger than m. And then, and now, if I define, I would look, okay, so now, let's look at the case, let's define uh, A, N, Delta. This is a set of Fourier coefficients, so this is A in the D, such that the Fourier coefficient of mu N at A is bigger than Delta. This is the same kind of set, um, maybe to be closer in notation to my previous lecture, I would use some kind of script F to denote it. Okay, so this is a set of large Fourier coefficients from UN. Go to the next board. Um, so I look at the covering number, so this is, I look at the set of Fourier coefficients for um, a set of big Fourier coefficients where I sort of sacrifice a bit on the number of uh, convolutions I give and they sacrifice a bit uh, on uh, what large means to me. This is this an infinite set in uh, ZD. I intersect it to a cube of size n. So now this is a finite set, finite subset of the cube of size capital N and I want to see how many smaller cubes of size capital M I need to cover this set. Okay, so this is this is a covering how many 
this seems is how so maybe I'll put this somewhere in the general notation what did I do wrong? if I have some set and M this is the number of M cubes cubes of size M by M by M by M by M needed to cover A so this covering number of the big Fourier coefficients as the resolution M which I remind you something which is polynomial in capital N um, should be bigger than um, some other power of delta n over m so it's essentially a positive you need almost as many m cubes to cover the set of big Fourier coefficients as you need to cover the whole n by n cube so this is um, the appropriate sense here that they start with one Fourier coefficient I get many I get many but I need to understand what many means many in this particular sense of the word now okay this is a nice uh, this is a statement this is also the main lemma this is the main lemma in the proof of the equity distribution result or this Fourier estimate or whatever you want to call it I gave earlier let's just end up we are faced now with a question of in, in abstract harmonic analysis we want to understand what we have here in our hands so here's another question in abstract harmonic analysis what does it mean for a measure for a probability measure u on t d that for some m less than n which are somehow polynomially related um, the set of big Fourier coefficients intersection cannot uh, are sort of uh, have this large covering number or in other words if you have bad eyesight you see that they are essentially dense uh, in this whole uh, set so this is some small c which okay times uh, n over m will be what does this mean how do I understand does this actually is this something which I can work with my hands understanding what happened so it turns out that you could understand this has an implication which you could sort of try to figure out it's in general you know that um, the more there's a general relation between for instance measure and the number of big Fourier coefficients uh, the more singular your measure is the bigger in general the Fourier coefficients tend to be so this condition is some should say that in some sense my measure is singular it's sort of concentrated on a small set let's try to see if we can um, 
figure out in which sense this is true. So, the idea is to divide um, the unit, the d-dimensional torus, into boxes of size um, one over m so I have something like capital M to the D very small boxes and then I can write mu is a sum I'm not normalizing I'm writing it as a, just a sum up to M to the D or whatever um, number of boxes I have with mu i is basically mu restricted without normalization to the ice box now because uh, Now, if uh, I have a big Fourier coefficient for some b, or some a, then somehow for many of the i's, um, u i of a should be bigger than delta times mu i of the appropriate box which is a total measure of mu i so I would have many now what did I gain by um, this partitioning trick well if my whole measure is supported on a very small box But for each uh, i, because it has such tiny support, the Fourier transform at some b is about the same as the Fourier transform of in some other point, as long as b minus b, b prime is maybe smaller than m or smaller than m over 100 or something right? there's sort of a continuity because when the support is sort of very localized I change a bit my uh, frequency I'm not changing much so for many of these new eyes somehow there are not just uh, there's a positive proportion of the Fourier coefficients in this big cube are large so if you have many Fourier coefficients in a big cube which are large this means that you're actually supported so this means that um, if I take the Fourier transform of mu uh, reflected so this is a measure you get on uh, by, by reflecting through the origin so now I have a measure whose uh, so I have this now I have a measure whose uh, a new measure this is additive convolution this is a new measure whose Fourier transforms are the absolute value of the original Fourier transform squared so this on a ball around zero of size one over n so the one over n cube around zero will it be large 
which basically, if you think about it, so somehow the concluding uh, abstract harmonic an analytic statement is that such a measure, so the conclusion of this exercise in, in uh, abstract harmonic theory is that um, some proportion uh, of the mass of my measure mu is supported on a union of very small of uh, very small boxes of boxes of size 1 over n that are separated at least by 1 over n so you have these tiny boxes separated from each other that contain a lot of the measure fine doesn't seem to be too bad, but my measure mu that somehow I get is not just any measure, I get it itself by convolving uh, some measure with, uh, with my uh, with my uh, matrices, with my uh, matrices in SLD, so it's some kind of operation which tends to diffuse things and it's quite inconceivable that after I diffuse things for a long time they would still be so much separated and you could sort of make this once you have this statement you could make it into a proof now um, I see that I'm sort of running a bit behind what I was planning. Let me just tell you one thing, one, one more ingredient uh, one more ingredient of the proof that would sort of show the analogy between uh, the case of uh, so what I did last time and what we did this time so here sort of last lecture at some point somehow we had a key fact was the following so this was the required proposition for every alpha there is some delta or epsilon such that if I have a set A, which is bigger than some set B, which is bigger than P to the alpha, then uh, there is some C in B such that A plus CA is bigger than A1 minus epsilon e to the epsilon. We had this uh, proposition. Um, the corresponding statement we would have we would, we would use in uh, to somehow bootstrap the number of uh, big Fourier coefficients in this sense is the following um, theorem of Bourgain which says that um, so it's sort of a theorem about if you think about it in a sort of this is some kind of projection of the product set A times A from uh, Z mod P squared to Z mod P so here's the theorem so for every alpha and beta there is some delta such that suppose 
I have some measure is a measure on the unit circle such that the measure of every R interval, interval of size R, is less than a constant R to the alpha. Okay, this theta plays the role of B in the above proposition. Then, for any set A in uh, the unit square, um, R positive, and suppose somehow the covering number of A by R balls is uh, R to the minus beta, with some regularity assumption on A, which I'm suppressing. But it's essential, I don't want A to be a very small cube or something. Some regularity assumption on A. Then there is some theta in the support of this capital theta, um, such that the covering number of the projection of A by R balls. So this is a covering in uh, two dimensions, this is a covering in one dimension, is bigger than sort of the trivial bound. If you sort of take at least two directions in one of them, you, your covering number would be the square root of the covering number you started with, plus an improvement. And somehow this theorem combined with um, a whole machinery that I didn't have time to talk to about products of the matrices, which is sort of basic theory that if I take these, at the end of the day I'm talking about the product of random matrices. If I take a product of many random matrices, you could in a very precise sense sense say that this product is essentially uh, a projection. You could think of it as being a rank one matrix up to some resolution. That's sort of going to be a dominant direction which is expanded and the rest are sort of negligible. And of course, you need to put Balog uh, Semeredi Garros, which is sort of the essential glue in any kind of argument of this type. You get uh, this uh, statement that if there's one for your coefficient, big Fourier coefficients. There are many big Fourier coefficients, which is the key improving the theorem. Okay, thank you. So A is some set here, and they take the projection in direction theta. Thanks. So there's sort of a well-known, um, you could deduce from it a statement about house of dimension. So there's, there's this uh, Marston projection theorem, which tells you that if you have a set in the square of a given house of dimension, then for almost every direction, the projection of the set would have either the dimension of your original set uh, or one, whichever is smaller. But this, and there are refinements, I think, by Falconer, which sort of tells you that has something about the set of exceptions. But all of these refinements do not tell you anything when the set of directions you want to project to are small. So a corollary of this theorem of Bourguin is that if you, that somehow, even if you have a very small uh, set of uh, possible directions you want to project, you could still get 
some gain over uh, half the dimension of the set you start to you want to project that somehow and puts this in sort of a more uh, more uh, the bigger somehow context hmm? yes yeah, so you could phrase it uh, the different way. Thank <laughs> you.